Hi, my name is Roger Carrillo from Miami, Florida, and we're going to talk about being prepared, the safety net around the procedure. My goal is to talk about how to prevent adverse events in the pre-procedural stage. And if you do have an adverse event during the procedure, how to make it a survivor. And we're going to finish with some conclusions. There are two things that are important in the pre-procedural stage. Meticulous technique and detailed planning. Not all the leads are equal. Not all the patients are the same. And it's not the same to extract for an infection than for a malfunction. For planning, we rely on pre-procedural imaging. We do a chest x-ray on every patient. And as you can see in these two patients going for extraction the same day, the one to the right has the superior vena cava coil scarred to the anterior part of the superior vena cava. And the one to the left has the superior vena cava coil scarred to the posterior part of the superior vena cava. Therefore, in this patient that has posterior scar, we need to be prepared to do multiple projections like right anterior oblique and left anterior oblique as we do the extraction to make sure we stay coaxial. On patients with infections, we do echocardiogram, especially a transit of a gel echocardiogram to look for the size of vegetations. On every patient, we do a gated CT scan of the chest with contrast, and we do 3D reconstructions to make sure that the leads are not extra cardiac to see how the leads are going in the anterior part or the posterior part of the superior vena cava and to see if there are adhesions to the superior vena cava. For that, we evaluate the CT scan in the upper part of the superior vena cava, middle and lower part of the superior vena cava. If the leads are floating in the superior vena cava, we determine that there is no adhesions. If the leads are embedded in the wall of the superior vena cava, we interpret that as severe adhesions. Once you have an adverse event during the procedure, how can you make it a survival? We use three strategies. One, early recognition of complications. Two, a team that is capable of handling the complication. And three, the use of endovascular occlusion balloons. The superior vena cava has two parts, the extrapericardial and the intrapericardial. As we can see here in an open chest with the pericardium open, we can see the nominate vein, the extrapericardial superior vena cava, and we can see the intrapericardial superior vena cava. Note that in the medial part, the pericardium is higher, and in the lateral part, the pericardium is lower. So as the extraction sheath is just below the carina, we are entering the intrapericardial portion of the superior vena cava. Here you can see a perforation in the superior vena cava and contrast in the pericardial space. We divide the complications of intrapericardials, the one that manifests with pericardial tamponade, and extrapericardial, the one that manifests with right or left pleural effusion. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we do median sternotomy. We discourage the use of pericardiosynthesis. We like to do median sternotomy on these patients who are hemodynamically unstable to repair the ventricular tears, the atrial injuries, superior vena cava laceration, or coronary sinus tears. A skilled surgeon can open the chest in a matter of minutes, as you can see in this unedited video. The surgeon opening the chest on this patient that is hemodynamically unstable with a uh, tear in the right atrium. The surgeon opened the pericardium and immediately relieved the tamponade. During a pericardial synthesis, you cannot release the clot or thrombus that are located in the heart and you cannot solve the problem. Therefore, the use of surgery with a median sternotomy and peri uh, open pericardium is the best strategy to make a survivor. The surgeon can easily repair the right ventricular injury or right atrial injury most of the time off bypass 
And complex injuries can be repaired with bypass. It's very important, therefore, to have a great team, a competent team. Surgeons, perfusionists, scrub techs, nurses, and one forgotten member of the team is usually anesthesia. Make sure the team knows exactly what to do and at times we do mock codes or serial drills in order to make sure that the team has everything they need to handle the complication. As we mentioned, anesthesia is usually the forgotten member of the team and they should be part of the extraction and they should be communicated on the steps of the extraction as well. Superior vena cava lacerations are half of the events where other half are other events. However, they are the most lethal events. For that, we use an endovascular occlusion balloon. As we see in this model, the superior vena cava is being opened and you can see immediate exsanguination. As well, you can see that once we deploy the endovascular occlusion balloon, there is decreased bleeding from the injury. And in this model, the superior vena cava also contain leads. And as you can see in the model as well, we can repair the superior vena cava injury of bypass just with the use of the balloon as well. When we have these injuries, time is of essence. Every second, we lose seven cc's of blood. Every minute, we lose 500 cc's of blood. And in five minutes, we will have lost 2.5 liters of blood. The endovascular balloon, specifically designed for superior vena cava application, is an eight centimeter pliable balloon that efficiently occludes the blood coming from the upper part of the body, as you can see in this venogram. We did a study looking at injuries in the United States in which surgeons were present at the time of the injury and opened the chest and treat the patient with median sternotomy and repair of the superior vena cava. We divided the groups into two groups, one in which the balloon was used and we have 88% survival. And the second group in which the surgeon was present but the balloon was not used, we have 56% survival. You can see that even though the surgeon was there, even though the surgeon opened the chest and repaired the superior vena cava, the use of the balloon definitely improved the survival and this was statistically significant. The two groups were the same on age, on gender, on devices, on indication for extraction, on tools used for a extraction, the duration of the lead or the age of the leads, the only difference was the use of the balloon. The locations of the tear were similar in both groups. Again, the only difference was in one group the balloon was used and in the other group the balloon was not used. So we concluded from our study that the patients in which the balloons were used, they were more likely to survive and it has a life-saving capabilities. We also look at the prophylactic use of the balloon in two centers, one in the United States and another one in Hamburg, and we did not see any deleterious effect on prophylactic use of the balloon on patients undergoing extraction, and we followed them for a period of six months. So to summarize, if you have a wire and a 12 French sheath, a competent extractor will deploy a balloon in 120 seconds. If you have a wire and six French sheath, a competent extractor will deploy a balloon in 240 seconds. But if you have a prophylactic balloon, a competent extractor will deploy that in 14 seconds. Conclusions. We would like to see less adverse events with detailed planning and meticulous technique. And we would like to see more patients surviving adverse events by early recognition of the complications, by having a competent team, and by the use of endovascular occlusion balloons. Thank you. <laughs>